thank you very much for the introduction. I presented this in November and then forgot uh, with my colleague Lily. So if anybody's already seen these slides, apologies, we'll whisk through and talk a bit more towards the end um, around the impact on teams, the impact on individuals of implementing um, and how in CNWL we implemented our trauma informed approaches to care. So um, my name's Sheila Holmes, I'm matron at Northwick Park and I look after two adult acute wards called East Lake and Fernley Ward. And I was part of a team here with um, psychology, our service manager, occupational therapy, um, who all on the work of Lucy Johnson and Boyle around the power threat meaning framework developed trauma informed approaches to care at um, Northwood Park and then subsequently rolling it out across the trust. The, um, we start with the slides. So a few statistics and actually probably the numbers of these will have gone up in the last year. 85% psychiatric inpatients have encountered sexual abuse. So we've got 63% of psychiatric inpatients will have experienced domestic violence in a year prior to their admission. Again, we know figures around domestic violence have increased in the last year quite significantly. 98% um, of those who hear voices, who report hearing voices, have also reported experiencing trauma. Um, People with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, 75% report that they have experienced sexual abuse in childhood. And of male psychiatric inpatients, 85% will have experienced abuse in childhood. So the statistics are quite grim um, and very, very high. I don't know if anybody's surprised by this, but certainly kind of speaking to our service users around their narratives of their experiences, we'll, we'll know how prevalent um, trauma in childhood is. So um, ACE is a massive study conducted in the mid 90s in America, and it looked at adverse childhood experiences. Um, so it had 15 year follow up. It um, had loads and loads of participants. There were hundreds of, of, of studies. It was initially commissioned by the CDC and a, um, an insurance company to look at adult outcomes of childhood experiences in terms of health. Um, and they identified 10 different types of childhood adver adversity. Um, and then from that found, surprise, surprise, there was a very strong relationship between encountering adversity in childhood to um, experiences of mental health, physical health, um, behavioural problems and social difficulty in adulthood. You can go to the next slide. So what are these adverse childhood experiences? Um, there's the list again, nothing massively surprising here. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, emotional neglect, exposure of um, domestic violence to children. Again, we know that this is kind of very much um, in the public arena at the moment and especially around recognising um, effects on children of parental domestic violence. Um, again, substance abuse within a household, uh, experiences of mental illness within a household, parental separation and where a member of the household is in prison. So these are the 10 areas of, of or adverse childhood experiences that were identified through this story. And the higher your ACE score, so the more experiences of um, adversity in childhood you'll have had, the greater instance of, I'm not going to read the list, but spans across um, unwellness and mental health, um, psychosis, fetal death, physical um, pay, uh, physical problems and difficulties, diabetes, drug use, migraines, arthritis. So really, um, the more adversity in childhood, the more adult health globally is affected, mental health, physical health and um, social health as well. So quite a massive impact. For people who are abused as children, we're thinking across um, different categories of abuse. 
um, 9.3 times more likely to be cut out to develop psychosis. The more kinds of abuse that somebody encounters, the more likely that is to manifest in adult uh, mental ill health. Um, and uh, really kind of exponentially gets bigger and bigger. So at five types of abuse encountered in childhood, that's 193 times more likely um, to develop psychosis. So we really do have massive, massive, or this really does have massive, massive impact on adult life and management. Um, so what is the trauma informed approach? So the trauma informed approach is, is really around changing the way that we think about experiences. We think about um, our service users in terms of, um, well, from the outside in. So we're not thinking what's wrong with you. We're not thinking what is your diagnosis? We're not starting with that. There is of course a place for diagnosis and understanding and treatment, but really the trauma informed model um, or framework or approaches looks at moving from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you um, and approaching distress from the outside in so rather than distress being something that is within a person burgeoning out and um, that actually it's, it's 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 an understandable response to experiences or trauma that somebody's gone through when we think of trauma we're thinking of trauma in the broadest context so we're not just thinking about physical or sexual abuse we think about trauma within the trauma informed approaches anything that has left a person feeling powerless, out of control, that's had an impact on, on a person's um, self-identity or um, thinking about um, a person's sense of self, sense of future. So not just, doesn't always have to um, include physical harm or sexual harm. Uh, trauma can be something like the death of a loved one, the loss of a parent, um, being at a socioeconomic disadvantage, um, all kinds of trauma. So anything that somebody feels powerless in relation to. And we also, with the, with the, with the trauma-informed approaches, view mental health as an understandable response to trauma. We'll get on to that a bit more um, as we, as we get to the power threat meaning framework and I think everybody's um, understood the impact of COVID as trauma as well as something we've all undergone in the last year and whatever kind of our situations have been wherever we've been working or not and um, it's a massive massive change it's something that we're not in control of have had no power over um, and that has really impacted our sense of self sense of future our lives so moving on, um, this is really lovely. So Dr. Karen Treesman, do have have a look, um, look her up. She does some really, really lovely infographics around um, around trauma and trauma informed approaches. She's got some lovely things around uh, trauma informed organisational culture as well. So they're nice things to have and look at and understand. Um, so as I said, we're like looking at trauma in the broadest context. Um, um, you know anything it can be a single event it can be kind of a community trauma um something that somebody else is with a sort of a secondary or 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 a vicarious trauma um so there's some nice examples of this you will have the slides as well so it's a nice one to print out stick on your walls so our trauma informed approaches north um there's it's a three-phase model first phase and this is what we encounter in inpatient acute is stabilization <coughs> So stabilisation is really around education and it's about coping and safety. So really, really supporting um, people feeling safe and and, and and unstable. The phase two really then is about kind of processing to think through what those experiences in life um, have been. So what's happened to you? Um, and um, this will be kind of a longer term uh, support really can be through therapy, um, can be through meaningful relationships, but working out um, one's trauma and, uh, and, and, and the impact of that. Um, and then the final phase is, is, is really taking up life again, moving moving forwards. Within our adult acute, where we're, we're focused on stabilisation. We can go to the next slide. So this is our uh, stabilisation manual. We've got um, uh, it's, it looks different now. It's been published, I don't know if you can see me in a tiny square, by CNWL, and it's 
has our introduction and then all of the lovely stabilization manuals on all of the different um all the different skills and workbooks and this everybody who comes into our services when we meet and go through a kind of getting to know you we give them the stabilization manual and um, there's work there's worksheets in there there's information there's resources so it's really all around kind of promoting safety and supporting and uh, next so this is the final slide and we'll kind of um this is really the uh, framework developed by Johnston Boyle um, around how we understand um, experiences as manifesting in, in, in the present, really. So um, it's called the Power Threat Meaning Framework. It looks at um, questions at each at each stage of the of, of the framework of the formulation to then kind of formulate an understanding um, and very often when we work through this we understand um, aspects of our service users that we hadn't before we are able to think about how perhaps we are replicating some of the patterns that they've encountered in the past it allows us to step back really understand what the narrative of our service users um, is and understand their current experience why they've come into hospital as 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 a, 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 an understandable response to the trauma that they've um, gone through or experienced. So just to work through it uh, briefly, when we think about power, we think about what's happened to you. Again, it's not what's wrong with you. What has happened in somebody's life? Where has power? Where where have the power imbalances been? Um, whether that's a loss, whether that's neglect, whether that's a societal um, misuse of power, whether it's um, physical disability, person's race, how person's been treated throughout their lives, loss, disruptions to attachment, all an imbalance of power. The threat then is what did that affect? So, for instance. An experience of domestic violence would threaten a sense of safety, a sense of identity um, and threaten life. We then move on to the meaning. So from, from experiencing, experiencing an imbalance of power to this threatening um, uh, a fundamental aspect of oneself, what, what does that mean? Um, we think about things that a person might say often as well as informing us what, 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 how they might have constructed constructed their meanings. So things like feelings of guilt, shame, um, uh, mistrust in people, a belief that all relationships fail, a belief that people are not to be trusted and are frightening, um, uh, a belief that there's something kind of wrong with, 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 with oneself. And then the, the threat response is, what did a person have to do to survive? Um, sometimes these are really healthy things. These are things that allow a person to really flourish in adulthood. Sometimes they're um, might be quite kind of damaging and no longer, well, they were really helpful within a point where somebody had to survive in later life or in adulthood once the traumas receded. Um, they can be something that no longer no longer supports well-being or kind of um, is a benefit to the person. So. We also might think of trauma responses and or threat responses rather in terms of symptoms. So um, a person who's experienced um, domestic violence, say, and has which has threatened their safety, they be begin to believe that there's something wrong with them, that they deserve somehow to have been treated so unkindly. Their threat response then might be to limit themselves in relation to, re uh, to relating to others to close off, to not seek out relationships because they're very frightening um, or to think that they're kind of not worth being a friend, leading to feelings of suicidality and um, subsequent attempts on their life, perhaps. So through the power threat meaning framework, what we do is we create a narrative and a, a story really um, for, uh, for our service users, how we understand that their presentation on the ward, that they're not engaging with us, perhaps they're seeming frightened. Sometimes, um, you know, physical aggression uh, can be understood in terms of a, 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 a reasonable response to trauma that they've endured. Um, so the last really bit I wanted to talk about 
was how we have implemented this in um, on, on the wards and what really does it mean for sexual safety. I think it's um, first off we have a team formulation every Tuesday afternoon so that's for um, that's something that we have um, two facilitators for usually and we alternate wards so each ward gets um, uh, team formula, we, we do formulations for every other week. So we bring um, a presentation or a um, summary of what we know about a service user's experience. Sometimes we'll speak to them, we'll speak to their families, get a bit more information, and then we work through the power threat meaning framework. <coughs> we think about um, power in terms of power resources in addition to power imbalances. So we always start with what 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 are this person's strengths? What what were they what are they good at? What do they like? What do they enjoy? Um, and then at the end of it, we think about ways forward. Very often, thinking specifically about sexual safety, um, and it's come up quite a lot recently. We un we begin to understand people's contexts in 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 terms of um, sexual identity and uh, sexuality, which is something that we wouldn't necessarily have questioned or thought of in relation to a person before. Um, whilst in order to support this happen, uh, the, 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 the team formulation, our uh, therapy, our occupational therapists and psychology team do a ward based activity on each of the wards. So that allows more um, more nurses to attend as well and that's also rolled out to our community uh, um, our crisis response team and our psych liaison team as well um, every friday we have training uh, it's for 45 minutes and uh, i'll just show you we, the training is based on the stabilization uh, packs so we go through the uh, workbooks and the role plays of how to support our service users um, so that's been really, and that's open to all. We've had a, a, a helpfully with Zoom, we've been able to um, get more and more people onto the training. So people can dip in and out of, 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 of that training every Friday. Um, and it's a rolling programme. Um, the manual which I showed you um, is available so that our, every time somebody comes onto the ward, they're met with a brief kind of getting to know you and uh, they're given a manual and then thereafter uh, depending on levels of engagement and interest um, we'll, we'll work through kind of various aspects really of, of, of that with them if, and, and that's very much sort of service user led in terms of what they'd like to work on in terms of the stability you know if it's general well-being whether it's sort of safety um, and one of the things that's kind of been challenging in both um, it was sort of an opportunity is around sort of nursing engagement. So it's all very well to have a psychology team and a therapy team that come in and do the work and are sort of placed to do the work. If it's not, if the language isn't within the nursing team, then it's it's something that gets quite split off. So that the um, the therapy team are having the conversations around experience, trauma, histories, less so, and and then that you're sort of responding with that understanding less so than the nursing team who are around sort of 3 a.m. when somebody's in the depths of crisis. Um, and as nurses, we, we, we gather stories. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of really much, uh, uh, we're, we're really at the forefront of, of, of our service user lives and experiences. So we're really kind of best placed to support the narrative, to understand, to ask the questions around people's life. Um, and, and, and adapt our language as well. Um, so that's pretty much everything I have to say. Um, are there any questions? I see there's some hands up or comments. 